Hi folks, it's good to be with you. I love to everybody out there and God bless you. This is Jason and my website is jasonburnspreacher.com and I'm doing this video for a young man or a man called Daniel who contacted me through my website. I made him a video this morning and I couldn't get it on by my phone so I thought I'd make it through the camera and just do a better job for him and I hope this is a blessing to you Daniel and I hope it's a help to you and Daniel asked me the question uh, if why Jason do you love the ch early church fathers so much and yet and know the early church fathers so much and yet you're not a Catholic it's a burning question he said so I want to answer that question why I'm not a Catholic and in relation to the early church fathers etc. I think there has to be uh, I think a, a misconce misconception dealt with here I think Daniel and that is that Protestants uh, are basically not into the early church fathers. That's a, a misconception by many people even by Protestants themselves and evangelicals when you look at the history of the church, uh, for example, if you look at um, John Calvin, if you look at his writings, um, he often men mentioned the early church fathers. If you look at an another example, um, are the Puritans. The Puritans mentioned the, Pur uh, the early church fathers a lot. If you look at the uh, John Wesley, uh, he mentioned the early church fathers a lot and so even a theologian today called Carl Truman at Westminster Theological Seminary mentions the early church fathers a lot. Now there are many evangelicals and many uh, evangelical scholars that uh, don't pay a lot of attention to um, the early church fathers but generally speaking there has been throughout Protestant theology a strong uh, study and appreciation of the early church fathers so that's the first point the second point is uh, why is it that I love the early church fathers and yet I'm not a Catholic I love the early church fathers because their writings are very rich Irenaeus against the heresies is an amazing book that you could just spend days and days reading his knowledge of heresies is great, his knowledge of scripture is great and you would be a fool not to appreciate Irenaeus's writings. Another one is Polycarp, another one is Ignatius. These men um, were mighty men of God and uh, again I've been enriched by reading their lives. Another writer is Origen. Many say that he's a heretic but uh, if you look at uh, Origen's writings, his writings are quite vast and for anybody to make a pronouncement on Origen you would have had to have read uh, much of his work to do that and I don't think many people have done that who pronounce uh, judgments on him. But Origen's work um, on his Gospel of John and many others is quite edifying and enriching and you could go to Athanasius, you could go to many of the others. They've enriched my life and they continue to enrich my life because they're full of scripture, they're full of wisdom and they defended the faith uh, in an amazing way, Tertullian, just in martyr. Now these people were not perfect, they made mistakes. Uh, for example, uh, Ignatius and Polycarp and the early church fathers like Irenaeus emphasised apostolic succession and in order to defend against heretics they they pushed hard on, against them and defending their base by apostolic succession which was a logical thing to do the problem is that it became more authoritative uh, to the scripture and some in the church took the implications of what they were saying to the extreme and made tradition above uh, the Bible. So I'm not a I'm not a, a Catholic because I believe that the early church fathers, some of them, made a mistake by pushing tradition 
apostolic succession above scripture now it was a mistake that they made because they were defending the heretics and that's the only way they saw how they could defend but I think that they should have been more clearer on the fact that there was an, a covenant and wherever the covenant is in the Bible there is scripture so in the Old Testament the covenant was given and scripture was given and in the New Testament a covenant was given and scripture was given so should, they should have been aware that they're a, a, a covenant people and as a covenant people there will be scripture and they weren't aware that the New Testament was the word of God there was deep discussions about certain books whether they should be in the canon or not but generally Paul's epistles and the gospels were generally accepted but the point is this it wasn't strongly uh, primary in their conscience it hadn't dawned on them like in a primary way uh, the primary defense was that they had the apostolic succession and because they could trace that back that was the default position and there's some wisdom in that in that if you can find that your source goes to the pure source and can be traced back to the pure source it's a good argument but it's not a good argument if it undermines scripture and so I think that uh, that's why I'm not a Catholic because the Catholics today are taking some of the early church fathers argument for apostolic succession and taking it to the point where they make the church and they make apostolic succession an authority tradition over the Bible and here I have um, a Catholic book and it's an apologetic book and um, it says here on page 20 of this book called where is the truth in the Bible and, it, and it's a, a Catholic book apologetics book by Pat Patrick Madrid he says Catholics often come under attack by non-Catholics especially Protestants because of their belief that the Catholic Church is the one true established by Christ Catholics should never explain or defend the doctrine in a haughty or tri triumphalistic way rather they should seek to show that in spite of the unworthiness of many Catholics Christ established his church so that it would be visible recognizable body with characteristics of holiness unity apostolicity that transcend the sinfulness and other imperfections of the individual members etc so he's basically saying the catholic church is the true church and one of the reasons is is that it goes back it can trace the apostolic line and just because you can trace the apostolic line does not necessarily mean that you're the true church the true church is identified by its commitment to truth and here in the Westminster Confession in chapter 1 is a beautiful statement of the Holy Scripture it says this it says in chapter 1 although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do far manifest the goodness and wisdom and power of God as to leave men in unexcusable Yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of his will, which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in diverse manners to reveal himself and to declare that his will unto his church, and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh and the malice of Satan and the world, to commit the same holy unto writing, which maketh the holy scriptures to be the most necessary, those former ways of God revealing his will unto his people. And there's a, a number of wonderful statements here about the scripture. It says the authority of scripture from which it ought to be believed and obeyed depended not upon the testimony of man. This is point four. Or church but wholly upon God who is truth itself the author wherein and therefore is to be received because it is the word of God now here is why I'm not a Catholic and why I'm evangelical and why I love the early church fathers but I part company with some of them because it says here 
in point four of the Westminster Confession, and it's backed up by scripture. We'll read some of the scriptures. But it says, The authority of the Holy Scriptures, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, depended not upon the testimony of any man or church, but only upon God, who is its truth itself, the author thereof, and therefore it is to be received, because it is the word of God. And we have scripture here, uh, 2 Peter 1 and 19. We have also a more word of prophecy, whereon ye do well, that you take heed as unto a light that a shineth in a dark in, in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. For the prophecy came not of old by the will of man, but by holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. 1 John Five nine. If we reason the witness of if we receive the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. So the Westminster Confession here is saying that Scripture is self-attesting. So it doesn't need the church; it doesn't need anybody to attest its truthfulness because God is the one that testifies to its truthfulness. And so the what the early church fathers did to defend the faith is they said. Well, most of them, or many of them, said it, it's apostolic succession. We can defend against the heresies because we can trace our apostolic line right back to the apostles. So Irenaeus could say Polycarp um, and Ignatius knew the apostles, and he's tracing his teaching through them, and so therefore his teaching is correct. His, his, his line of purity goes right through that line. And that was his defense. And that was their defence. And it was a logical defence. And it, and, it, and, it, and it seemed a very credible defence. But here in the Westminster Confession, it's saying, no, the primary defence is the scripture itself, that God will testify to the truth through his word. And as the church began to meditate on the New Testament, it came to, it, it, it gradually it began to dawn on them, as you get to Athanasius, who makes the final list, it's not the list that makes the scripture, but the church, right up into other nations, have begun to realize the self-attesting nature of scripture. You see. Now, you have to be careful. You have to be careful. Because there's dangers on extremes. On the one hand, we do have to respect the fact that there is an apostolic succession with the early church fathers. They knew the apostles. And so we cannot push that aside and say that's not important. It is important because, for example, um, most of the early church fathers early on, uh, Tertullian, Irenaeus, Polycarp, etc., mentioned the four Gospels. And the mentioning it gives authority and credence to the various names that are, are accounted to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So... The apostolic succession, in the sense that the early uh, writers of the early church fathers, having connection with the apostles, uh, gives historical credence and a helpful historical defense of, say, the four gospels. Excuse me. So we can't. We don't. We don't throw that away. That's valuable, and is is and, and is is very very important. The fact that the Ignatius. And Polycarp and Irenaeus and others can trace that as opposed to the other uh, other um, heretics. It's massively valuable and gives uh, a brilliant historical defensive argument. But with the confession, the danger is if we push it too far, above the authority of scripture if we push the authority of scripture to the point where we say we don't need the church and we don't need the history of the church then we'll lose the testimony of the church and the history of the church that does testify to scripture but what the Westminster Confession is saying that ultimately the ultimate authority rests with God alone upon scripture 
And that's important because if you go to the side where you say the apostolic succession is authoritative above scripture, then you get into what happened with the history of, of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church got into a mess because it pushed the authority of, of scripture to the sideline and emphasized apostoli ap apostolicity, the, the, the importance of tradition, the authority of tradition and the church and church leadership above scripture. And things like indulgences came in which are not biblical, things like uh, um, uh, purgatory which was not scriptural came in and uh, doctrines and teachings and and things that commandments by popes and and councils that had nothing to do with scripture were made as if they had authority again I, I come to the purgatory and indulgences is just two examples but there are many examples and so that led the Catholic Church to veer off into heretical teaching and into darkness because it, it left the Spirit and the Word uh, being taught by the Spirit and the Word of God. <coughs> and so you, 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 there's always dangers by emphasizing one side too much above the other. So coming back to your statement, Daniel, I love the early church fathers. They, they are important because they are the early church fathers. They're connected to the apostles. And there is a rich tapestry of scripture uh, studies there that every Christian should study and will learn immense fruit and immense blessing from studying them. But to remember that they're not perfect, that they had mistakes. Uh, for example, uh, Justin Martyr, trying to defend the faith, made a mistake when he said that uh, the Greek gods were similar to the Trinity. Now, he was trying his best. He tried to show that there was a connection, that this was culturally relevant to the times of the Greek, to the Greek people. And he tried to connect that, but that was a dangerous thing because then today people could say, oh, well, the Trinity is like Greek theology, uh, Greek uh, philosophy and Greek religion because Justin Martin noticed that. But Justin Martin was not perfect. He made a mistake. He pushed his analogy too far. Uh, sometimes um, the early church fathers got in a mess with uh, Origen where... It seems to be that uh, though he was a great scriptural uh, man, he seemed to have been uh, at times uh, enamoured with uh, philosophy and uh, he wasn't perfect. His pronouncements on scripture, what was canon, often changed and he often made mistakes on that. And But he made some great great comments about scripture uh, we have a list that's set by origin that he names all of the new testament but then we have other statements where he questioned whether hebrews is in in the in the canon and even recommends um a, a non-new testament book and one or two early church fathers have done that they were not perfect they made mistakes they made mistakes so anybody who disparages the early church fathers looks down on the early church fathers and says that we don't need them and we're, they're not valuable they're fools they don't know what they're talking about anybody who exalts the early church fathers in the apostolic succession above scripture is also a fool because your danger of moving into darkness because scripture has to have ultimate authority scripture is the is the test and the foundation of what of what we're holding on to but anyone who undermines the church and the church's role in defending the faith and defending truth is also foolish because the scriptures say that the church has a responsibility its officers have a responsibility to defend the faith but it's a matter of emphasis what your emphasis what is your what is your major emphasis the catholic church majors on apostolic succession above scriptural authority and that's dangerous the Protestant theology i.e. the classic in this uh, confession of faith balances it there is statements here about the importance of the church 
the importance of offices, offices of uh, ministerial offices, but it also lays the foundation of saying, look, the significance and importance of our authority is primarily scripture, which is self-attesting. Because the moment scripture is not self-attesting, but can only be scripture because the church says it is, it is not scripture. By definition, it's only scripture because the church says it is. Scripture is scripture because God says it is. Within scripture itself, it is inherently God's word and he testifies it. So I've, I've done now. I hope that's been a blessing. I hope that's been a help and God bless you. Take care. The phone's ringing and I've got to go. But I hope that's been a help and I hope that I've cleared up things for you, Daniel. God bless you.